Good evening. What a pleasure to see you all tonight at AUB. And I seize this opportunity to thank AUB, the Faculty of Engineering and Architecture, and Dr. Leila Musfi, Dean of Department of Architecture and Design, as well as Professor Karim Najjar for hosting us. For those who don't know me, I'm Raya, I'm Raya Raphael Nahas, General Manager of Banque Libano Francaise. Despite the tense atmosphere in Lebanon and the very recent attack targeting our banking sector, we are very happy and proud to prove once again through this event the vitality and sense of responsibility of the Lebanese banks, which not only are the pillar of our national economy and the beacon of the stability of Lebanon, but also stand behind almost every cultural, social or artistic project in town. At BLF, we traditionally trust that this is an essential part of our responsibility towards the community, hence towards a sustainable banking sector. As you may probably know by now, we are today at the final stage of the international architecture competition for our new headquarters. The competition featured eight local and, uh, and international studios, selected among the 35 that I have visited last year with our consultant Luca Molinari that I thank here. The eight studios are Danish American Big, BRK Ingels Group, Italian Spanish Barozzi Vega, British Farshid Musawi, Japanese Kengo Kuma, Italian Puark, Norwegian American Snoheta, and our Lebanese stars, Nabil Holam and Youssef Tame. The eight architects first came to Lebanon in January 2016. They were given a design brief stressing on the project consistency with BLF identity, the importance of its relation within the urban scene at the northern entrance of Beirut, the working space's capacity to enhance employees' quality of work, its ecological approach, as well as the creation of public spaces with the ability to contribute to the development of the Marmchayel area. The architects returned in April to present their project in front of an international jury involving notably Hashem Serkis, Dean of the Faculty of Architecture in MIT, Jean-Christophe Romantin, member of the French Parliament and mayor of Neuilly-sur-Seine, and Zi and Li Zhang, professor at Beijing and editor-in-chief of the leading architecture magazine, World Architecture. As you can see for yourselves in the exhibition displayed outside, all eight projects were remarkable. Therefore, the jury could not determine one winner and launch a second phase for the competition, shortlisting three studios who answered best the design brief and requesting them to further develop their proposals and come to present again, which they will do tomorrow. The design brief we submitted does not only ask for the building to become a visible landmark, well integrated in its contemporary urbanity, but also requests the interiors of the building to become a benchmark for corporate architecture at large. The purpose of the new interior layout should pave the, the way for a new style of working, promoting sharing and cooperation. The goal is not to work harder, but to work smarter. And this can only be achieved through a fruitful collaboration between an able architect and a willing client. The willing client is BLF. And we embarked on this passionate venture to find the able architect. And we are almost there. In the meantime, and as we did in April, in an event held at Cerso Museum, we wanted to seize the opportunity of the presence in Beirut of our STARS architects to offer you the chance to meet with them, benefit from their experience, and listen to their views. Ladies and gentlemen, BLF is extremely honored to share with you the privilege of attending talks followed by a debate by the duo Fabri Fabrizio Barozzi and Alberto Vega from Barozzi Vega Studio, please. Ketil Thorsen from Snoheta. <laughs> and David Zahli from Big. <laughs>
Yes, I'm very sorry to tell you that Bjarke Ingels unfortunately missed his connection today and will only be arriving late tonight in Beirut. I know a lot of you may be disappointed, but I have no doubt you will be all captivated by his partner, David Zahli, who already carries a bit of Lebanon in his name. <laughs> The 10 winners of the Facebook game we launched last week will have the chance to meet Bjarke tomorrow night for dinner. I will leave now the floor to Luca Molinari and those you are, those you are impatiently waiting for. Thank you. Okay, so we are all waiting for the, the three talks. Uh, as as uh, uh, Raya says before, a uh, few months, two, one, nearly two months ago, we had the chance to see all the eight participants of the competition together at the Sussoc Museum, which was a quite an amazing uh, situation. Never happened to have all of them together. And uh, for, the, for the second stage, we, we prefer to do something completely different. So we, we asked three or the three the members of the, the three offices selected to decide the keywords for the future. So to, to point out a, a hotspot, a keywords, which can be interesting for us to look at the future, uh, uh, let's say, scenarios. So it will be very interesting. Each of them will have 20 minutes. Uh, will be a, a smart, fast talk, but I think it will be very interesting to listen through their work and experience how they are looking to the future using a, a, a very sensitive keywords. But at the same time, BLF launched a competition between students, and in a few days we asked the students of architecture of Lebanon to present their own keywords for the future. And it was quite amazing because in a few days, I know it's, we are getting closer to the end of the courses, we are the exams, so I know that you are all very busy, but we received 39 pr pr proposal participations. So all those students sent to us, to, to the BLF uh, Facebook, uh, a proposal, a text with uh, less than 100 words and sometimes images, and uh, we we, we study them, we, we go through all those, all those beautiful texts, and, uh, and at the end we have to select only 10, because this was the, the, the beginning, the rule of, and so those are the 10 winners, the one will uh, spend with us tomorrow night uh, with the three offices at dinner together. So here are the 10 winners. I will only use, I will only tell about the keywords. Keywords are dialogue, upcycling, biomicrity, inclusive architecture, resiliency, built without buildings, perception, interaction, connection, and appropriate. You will see uh, the, the text, all the, not, not only the, the keywords, but also the text published on the, on the, on the Facebook and on the website of the, of the competition. So you will have the chance to read the, the 10 winners and also the other who were so uh, kind to send their proposal. And I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's fantastic to, to face uh, a future to face uh, the, 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 next, the, the step forward. And uh, now I think it's best to, to, to move directly to, to Kittel, to Kittel Thorsen from Znohetta, who is the first one, and he will talk tonight about collaborative working methods. Please, Kittel. Impossible to 
do without being embedded in exactly the place where you are at all times. So if we look at the future of architecture in a sense that it is not about the objects anymore. It is not about the creation of something that stands out. But it's purely about the collaborative process that as a result has an object. As a result has a way of interpreting the position that we as people are standing with it. Now these processes can be done in a very precise manner because creativity is common to all of us. It can be learned. We're not born with creativity, but what we do know is that it is distinctive. Again, back to the place where you are. You are created within the setting you're within all the time. Never outside. As distinctive as these reindeer DNA, 20,000 years of DNA, reindeer DNA. Now they are the same, but their individual perception of themselves being a reindeer is of course being a reindeer. That means that it is distinctive to the end that you have to simplify it. You have to get the core of the things that you're looking for. This simplification <coughs> is not taking away the complexity of the things you're working with. It is a layered complexity of reality, of technology, of things that you're relating to in society. But the simplification is the core of the issue that you're looking for. Once you get under the skin of the things you're designing. And at the core of these elements, you will find people. The collaborative methods that are related to how you can utilize each other into creating better futures, we have defined as transposition. It is the next generation after multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary. Now we're talking transposition, which means that you people can transposition yourselves into a singular in the plural. Which means that if you have an engineer around your table, don't accept the fact that he's only an engineer. Get the musician out of the engineer. If you have an artist at your table, don't be happy with him being an artist. Get the landscape architect out of the artist. And by doing that, you're swapping your positions in the collaborative working methodology. So at the end, you're without the pre-assumptions that the things that you could not achieve were based on bad experiences. Because there are no bad experiences. When you move forward in trying to do this role game in creative work, you're very close to what musicians do when they rehearse in large orchestras. They change their instruments. Why do they change their instruments? Because the guy playing the trumpet needs to understand how soft the violin is, how soft the touch is it, and the other way around. And before you have rehearsed on each other's instruments, within each other's professions, you will not be able to collaborate. The word is transposition. Now once you've done that, one time, you'll never go back. You'll never go back. It is an extraordinarily giving process. And you get so close to the people you're working with, and you understand the whole person. Not only parts of the person. You're getting the engineer for free in any case. And if you get the musician out of the engineer, you're getting something in addition. Now that, when it comes to people, and how you transposition yourself, is also within time, but can also be within location. Like our offices in Oslo and New York. As you will see, we're looking for similar locations around the world when it comes to how to locate the practice. Because we organize ourselves in a transpositional manner, also from the workspace situation. 
Here you will see a lot of squares. They represent people sitting in an office space. Normally, these people will be organized in a traditional manner with communication lines going back and forth, everything organized. No. We locate landscape architects, designers, architects, interior architects, out of project teams, out of their own profession. And all of a sudden we have an organizational diagram which looks like this. From that point on, you can start saying the spaces you're within become your mental and physical connection to the people you're working with. Architecture has a strong psychological effect. I know it looks like a mess, and it isn't. It actually does reflect this diagram really well. And if you look at the picture, you will see what I mean. Now, does that mean we're not in control? Of course not. Because through very organized workshops, very precise manner of building up how the knowledge is being distributed between the different people, you will see that there is a logical process that happens based on the people involved. There are many levels. They can be with students, but they can also be with professionals from other groups. They can be with a firm of lawyers, if you like, and especially with the bank. Now, in these situations, for instance, here at the World Trade Center workshop, the results that are driven forward are based on the, not the primary sentences that are spoken by the people involved, but sometimes by the secondary sentences, the small sentences, that all of a sudden sort of float to the surface and become the content of the idea. And that's why you need to utilize the problems within every millisecond of time when you're concentrating on words being created. I think it is important, as we will see when, it move, when we move from people to process, that these type of processes are so tightly connected with how your body is feeling at that particular point in time. Remember that architecture is not done with your brain. It is done with the whole of your body. With your hands, with your feet, with your stomach, with your chest, with your back. And that's why people also are the most important contributor for architecture. There is no architecture without people filling it. That is the definition of architecture. That's why it's different from art. There is no architecture without people. There is a lot of art without people. Never, ever architecture. And when people start filling up the architecture, that's based on what you provide them with and how you involve these people at different levels. Whether they're small or old doesn't really matter because they have something to protect, something that they want to learn. Like here, the inhabitants of Alexandria protecting the library in Alexandria during the Arabic Spring, 24 hours a day. Why would they do that? Because the building belongs to them. There is no other reason. And without the people, there would be no building to protect. But also, it would be impossible to protect the building. So it's content driven. And the way you content drive collaborative work today is you understand the value of each and every one that we're involved with. We spent a time with the lighting company called Sunto to interview four people over 100 years old north of the polar circle to get that view on the light north of the polar circle. These 104 and 105 year old people became specialists simply by age. It's a fantastic notion to understand that simply by age you become a specialist. Now these are the last of the generation that were born without electrical light. And for us to understand that in the translation of why you do what you're doing, you have to understand the position of these people that have gone through the whole process since before the 1900s. Now, this came out as a book. It became an exhibition. And all of a sudden, we had four heroes. We had never been outside a little village in the northern parts of Norway and Sweden. And they were exhibited large scale in Berlin. And their faces showed up in all the German newspapers. And all of a sudden, they represented something more through their specialization of age. But this with people and connectivity as you move forward, it's about realizing what you're in contact with. 
for the things that might happen through design in nature, in landscape, simple improvements might sometimes be the most important thing that you experience, like here for the national parks in Norway. So if you take people and then look at how do people move into process. Process can be defined in, in, a, in a way of working. The process is also a movement from H, B to C. It's moving yourself from a certain position into a next position. And we have, within this whole book, called IdeaWorks, created a series of generic drivers, which you can all relate to, whatever profession you're in. They are generic because they touch upon the way of thinking that will lead you, together with others, towards certain results. Number one generic driver is zooming. Now, zooming in architecture means look at things from the distance, but it could also mean, in the end, zooming in all the way into the details of the things you're doing, down to the smallest screw and the detail that you're doing. So zooming is a continuous process of distance and closeness. It can be, in many situations, of course, related to the very fact that the framing of the thing you're looking at is the most important portion of making it possible to zoom in and out. Maybe just simple architectural elements will make you focus on how you yourself use your eyes to zoom in. Because remember, the horizon for each and every one of you is always where your eyes are. Always. If you go 200 meters up, the horizon follows you the 200 meters up. That's why when, when you come down from the mountains here outside Beirut, the water looks like a wall. Because the horizon is high up there. As you come closer <laughs> down to the water line, you will see the horizon spread out horizontally. But these type of framings are important for our mind, not to set things into context, but to be able to zoom in certain situations. Another part, generative resistance, is to be found in trying to create buildings which are environmentally sound and CO2 negative, which means also you have to include embodied energies, which means you have to be in control of the energy that goes into the production of all the materials of the building. That is resistance today, whether it's a big office building or one family house. Or whether it's the ladies in Guatemala City that are being threatened by cars that come into the center of Guatemala City and can no longer sell their tomatoes or oranges on the sidewalk. So when the mayor of Guatemala City asked us to do a project in Guatemala City, he said, okay, will make benches to stop the cars from driving onto the sidewalks for the ladies to be able to sell their tomatoes. So that is now to the local artists, the project with over 300 benches happening. You don't think this is an important uh, creative driver, do you? That it is. Liberating laughter is one of the most important things to do. It releases you in your perception of yourself. And it gives you a possibility of broadening your own mind. At that particular point when you're laughing, you're releasing inner forces. Never forget to laugh while you're working, because it is truly liberating. What about curiosity? You would all say, yes, of course. Curiosity is part of being trained. But we're all born with curiosity. For the 9-11 memorial, the billion in New York at the very beginning, we were looking at something that we were really curious about. That was trading two realities at the same time. Real time. Through a prism, you could all of a sudden see two things happening at the same time. Of course, that would mean that the light that we brought in into the pavilion would reflect inside the, 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 the green of the trees, the gray of the street, and so forth. So I'm sure that if they had understood what we were trying to do on an individual basis, they would have allowed us. But security came in and said, 
What if we have an explosion here? You have thousands of prisms flying around. How beautiful would that look like? And from that point of view, again, this whole thing of working against the mythology that you're within, this is Pei White, the artist for the stage here at the Opera House of Oslo. This is not an object. This is a purely vulgar, flat textile, working against the strategies of three-dimensional works. Or the pavilion for jazz music in Concord, where the curiosity was saved by the fact that we found out how the music would travel through the city and in fact um, end, fortunately, into a small beer tent downtown, far away from the music. But it could also be just discovering things that are left over in the curiosity of these things. This is for a company called Sapa, where we, they produce aluminum uh, uh, profiles, and we did their profile. Uh, uh, and looking at the things they've left over, things nobody cares about. They are extraordinary. This is a book. Sorry. <laughs> rapid prototyping. Why, when I talk about creativeness within the rapid prototyping moment of argument? Simply, because through rapid prototyping you get quick results. You can test your own brain quickly in three dimensions to make sure that what happens is part of what you see at the end. This is a reindeer building that's right. Which then, starting off choosing the wood, in a very analog manner, choosing wood, drying wood, picking each uh, piece of wood for the production line, and then. Just talking, mm -hmm. just being with each other. 
But it could also be training young craftsmen, like the craftsmen that were actually doing by Bernard Tandem. Over two years they spent. It could be going all the way into the courts, like from the Opera House in Mosul, choosing the place where we bring out the stone. <coughs> And then I should look at the surface and be hands-on when it comes to this type of thing. Now I'm talking probably a little too long, but I will take another five minutes before I finish on. So knowledge-based intuition is an important part. There is no knowledge coming out of them. It all has to come from somewhere within. You have to read something, see something, combine something. Even Einstein did not take these ideas out of thin air. It does not exist people. Don't despair if you think you're not original. Originality comes with a combination of understanding. It doesn't come through the way you push yourself to be the first inventor of something. It doesn't exist. Like, for instance, the author Paolo Calvino, when he talks about with Marco Polo in the book Invisible Cities, which by the way students like Christian is a must read. Uh, talks about the keystone in the Roman arch. Saying the keystone is our culture. If we remove this keystone, the whole Roman arch will collapse. So it's holding everything together. So by designing a building in Saudi Arabia, which has a keystone, making a point out of the fact that the keystone is the smallest stone, then all of a sudden you will see that we have a building which will collapse if you remove this keystone. It is important to understand that these translations then all of a sudden become parts of yourself, like fingerprints, like individualized elements that belong to the same part or the same family. And prototyping. Knowledge-based intuition is also the knowledge about the materials. How can they be used? How far can you stretch them? How much can you actually do in order for them to survive? How soft can they be? How hard can they be? How can they be used constructively? How can they be used for energy? Take a simple element like round earth. Old building material, uh, material in Saudi Arabia. Hasn't been used for hundreds of, years, uh, hundreds of years. We had such a hard time convincing that we have to go back and do round earth. Now we've done this huge round earth walls together with the stainless steel pipes. That all of a sudden becomes part of the future, part of the past. You have high tech and you have low tech. Time does not define architecture in the same way as it does with other things. You can look a thousand years ahead and be uncertain. You can also look a thousand years back and be uncertain. But in the combination of these, there is something that we can also call a future. Sarah, the flooding, stainless steel pipes, holding the water, draining the building from heat. But it could also be simply moving a big stone. You know that this stone won't break because you cut in the stone before. This stone weighs 140 tons, 7 meters wide, 60 centimeters thick, 15 meters tall, cut straight out of the surface transported to Berlin and became the main facade of the Norwegian embassy in Berlin. But also again back to the race. <laughs> but not only because they're reindeer living around the snow the mountain with the reindeer captains, but also because they're found as paintings on a cave in Lascaux in France. 15,000 year old paintings. They are the same genetically DNA related reindeer as the ones you see in the photograph. Painted on the walls of Lascaux. And right now we're doing the Lascaux Cave Museum, which is on the construction of the Museum. Which is based on, again, the same type of knowledge and the way you're dealing with the things, handcrafted discoveries. The caves have been 3D scanned. That was a 0.3 millimeter position. Now we're discovering engravings in the caves that we didn't discover before we scanned it. So by copying the caves, we find out more about the caves than we ever knew before.
Be generous. This is a long one. The library in Alexander is generous in space, it's generous in design, and it's generous in the way it is. The opera house also is generous towards one, and it's generous towards humanity. Just simply based on the fact that when you walk somewhere, it belongs to you. When you're close to something, it belongs to you. When you hold it, it belongs to you. The same comes for Times Square in New York, which now is getting rid of all its cards, opening up for new functions completely new ways of seeing yourself within that space. Of course, this is not allowed in the space. You will always have people working against you. But finally, some of these things don't succeed. They don't win. They don't win. Because this girl wins in the end. He wants to have a birthday on Pashmore. And this guy wins because he can now stand on top of a new bed. <laughs> <laughs> the same comes for real metro stations. So what is this real metro station power? Yes, first of all, it's for transporting women along for the first time. But at the same time, it generates a public plasma. And should you want to shout out your meaning at some point in time in the future, at least you have a place where you can do it. It's the only way of building public squares in Saudi Arabia is to do it in connection with large transport uh, hubs. To so take the opportunity to really shift the way you're thinking with these type of things. So this is where we want to go. Being generous also means designing for others continuously. This year, our new money is coming out. We've designed the money for uh, Norway next year. Money bills that you actually pay for in the shop. It's probably the last generation of money. Um, that's why it's important to us. It's based on wind speed in Norway. So the 50 crown which you will see has small pixelation, 100 crowns longer, 500 longer, uh, no, 200 longer, 500, and 1000 is the full store. So you should know that when you're spending 1000 crowns, it's a store. <laughs> So the next uh, time when any of you come to Norway, please here, you will be paying cash. Le Monde, General City, was based on Louis Berger, saying after the terror attack on Charlie Hebdo last year. He was saying, we want the competition for the Le Monde headquarters in Paris, and he said, I want an open, accessible media house, Monday after the attacks. So what we do is we try to look at that from the contextual situation and open up a media house, which will start construction in about six months. And by that, generating a building which generously arches over a public space, which is less unit in there. But it could also be just a lampshade installation for the Singapore Light Fest which takes the light during the day, shades it down the wall, and translates that into light into the inner space at night. Or it could just be the beehives. Beehives for 80,000 bees producing 80 kilograms of honey each. Be generous, everything. Everyone, they will get in. Trusting presence, I've talked about already, just to show you the four places we have in the practice. Dining, meeting table, the meeting place, the workshops with the, with the big CNC machine, and the conversation, <coughs> most important right in the morning. But it could also be these small places that you create for other people open 24 hours. We call them keyless structures. <coughs> Tiny little built cabins that are open 24 hours a day. For people to just pop in, stay overnight, heat up. By that, maintaining crafting traditions, like here with the wood, which is hand carved by an axe. It could also be azo, it could be skin treatment, and it could be play powers for children, grown up or younger. Marshall is another driver, and I'm not going to talk much about it, but you all know about Marshall. Marshall is about taking the courses that come against you and turning it against your enemy without using much force. 
It is extremely important in certain settings of architecture to know how that operates. Because architecture is never about providing the right. It is about concerns, but it's never about taking the fights as a straight up fight. That could be within arts as well. The roof of the opera house, 30,000 different pieces of stone, is breaking all the building regulations. But it can only do that because it's art. All these pieces are art pieces. This is also not according to building regulation, but it's an art installation by Ulla Fadiyasa. Slowly, over 10 minutes. Or it could be the slow changing light that works against you. But once it's your friend, it works with you. We'd love to pray we do that a lot. Talk as much as you can. In your own place, in your own practice, where you are. And never forget punk production. Punk production becomes part of the soul of a let's say, create a driver that puts your side of how society actually works. This is a house to die in that we designed for artists called John Lennon. He started to build next one. He gave us these drawings, we interpret these drawings into three dimensions, <coughs> and then he gets his house. To die in which we burn before he does. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I would like you all to thank Etel and wish him a happy birthday because it's his birthday today. <laughs> Is good evening. Is better with my micro because my voice is not is is, is not like the kitty voice. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, okay, it's a bit strange with the micro, but uh, I, I hope it works. Um, okay, I for for today presentation I prepare uh, something quite short and and also I hope so quite uh, didactic because uh, most of you are students, are architectural students, so I will try to uh, just to explain in a didactical way some, some thing in, in which we, we, we believe. No? Um, for today, 
the BLF, the, the, the people from the communication, Luca for the BLF, they ask uh, has uh, to define no, a, a word, a, a key word to define the future uh, of the architecture. No? And but really this uh, question was extremely difficult. No? It's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to find one word able to to resume or synthesize a, a different idea, no? and discover also how how the the, the future of our, our architecture it will be. So I can say that uh, I don't know how the future of architecture will be. I have no idea about that. But for today, I can explain in what we believe. No? And if we believe in something, if we work in, in, a, in a way uh, and, and not in another, maybe in understanding these things can give you some idea of what the future of architecture could, could be, in a way. So uh, we selected this word, humanism, to to, for the presentation. Uh, it is because basically uh, we, we believe in this type of approach to architecture. Um, why humanism? But as, you, as you know, humanism is a term that uh, uh, became from the Renaissance. You know? And in a very synthetic way, they, it means that uh, the center of all reflection must be the people. No? Uh, during this period, uh, dominated from different uh, religious dogma and, and, and other things, uh, the, the, the society start thinking or start to believe in, in people. And, and I think that this uh, way uh, of thinking is absolutely necessary also to understand how to do architecture. Um, it's quite easy to explain uh, how to do different things, but it's terrible, very, very difficult to explain why we do something, no? why we choose one way of thinking and not another way of thinking. No? And we think that all the, reflect, the reflection around architecture must be focused on people. And, and for this uh, reason, we choose this uh, word, humanism. Because finally, architecture is not for the architects, but is for the citizen, for the society. It's for people. And if we translate this idea in architecture, we think then one architect, the architecture must be public, must be specific, it must be based in some fundamental element. Uh, I think that um, these three words are the translation of this term in, in an architectural uh, uh, way. Uh, an architecture must be public because basically is for society. So the, 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 the translation for the concept to, to the architect is quite direct. But also, uh, every people, every person are, are different. Uh, every society is, is, uh, is different. Um, and every society is linked for a specific context. And for this reason, we think that all architecture must be very specific, a very mm, precise for a, 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 an undeterminate condition. No? And for the reason, we think that we put there specific. And also, thinking on humanism means uh, thinking about what the people need. And sometimes the people don't need so much. So, but it is important to identify the very basic, the very basic needs and 
with on these needs construct architecture. So I will try to explain these three concepts no? uh, with our project and, and try with our project to explain this, uh, this idea. Uh, so an architecture must be public and uh, it, it must be centered on the reflection on the, on the, the public space. It's what is very important for an, for an architecture. So, for example, we love this type of, of uh, architecture. This is a plan by the Uffizi, no? where architecture and, or, yeah, or an urban form are more or less the same. Uh, this element is an architecture, but also is an, an urban place is a people for, for to, to meet there. No? So in a way, um, architecture and, and urban are more or less the same things. And all our projects are based in, in this idea. We start, they start thinking on urban, they start thinking the urban space, and then we arrive or we achieve uh, an architecture, no? and exactly that is what uh, we, we uh, are doing in Switzerland for a fine art museum in, in Lausanne. The, in, in this project, what is very, very important is this core, is this big plaza, and the architecture is just a frame of the urban. No? All the urban structure is Create is make like is is done like this to create a public space. And so, what what is very important is the space, the urban space that we are able to create between the different between the different building. And after that, the architecture is just a frame, no, to create a social life in this in this part. And this simple, very simple idea, it's also uh, present in, since our uh, first project at the, at the beginning. No? Uh, the extension of a school is just a void, it's just a plaza that connects uh, the, the school with the new extension. And in a way, the architecture disappeared is not important in itself. What is important, it, it is the landscape that uh, the architectures is able to, to build, to construct the, this empty space, this, this void, this space for, for public and for, for so social life. Or this, old, this idea is still present in, more, uh, in a more recent project in, in Zurich, where the building is just a facade, it's an urban uh, screen no? facing the, the river, that's that. And it is done for that just to create again the possibility to move around the river there, to move there or to move on the top of the, of the building. And in a way, the, here the architecture is not so important. What is important is the capacity that the architecture have to create this, this topography no? and, and, and create a, um, movement in all the, the level of, of the building. And also the idea of the public space can go inside of, of the building and there are no division between the outside and the, and the inside. No? And all these uh, elements means that in a way the architecture is created just to create public space. And as I said before, uh, thinking on humanism means also thinking about what is specific. Um, uh, the, 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 it is important for us that each architecture is very, very specific for, for a context. Every, what is important is to preserve the difference, the differences no? between different uh, society and different uh, contexts. 
And this is a, a detail of, uh, of uh, a painting by Petin Patinier. Uh, and he present here a, a landscape, no? and a context, uh, it's more than something physical. A context it's on, is, is for sure something physical, but is, is, there is also an imaginary context. Uh, there is also um, other thing that, other reality between a context. And an architecture must interpret all the realities that exist in, in a context. And, and, and if you are able to do, to do that, we are also able to preserve the differences and the specificity of different contexts and, and different um, uh, culture also. And so following this idea uh, is, is what guided one project that we made in Poland for a philharmony. Uh, learning for a context means also learning for a precise building there that is still exists and we are able to transform, to transform it in something new, no? in another building, reinterpreting this, this, this context. So there is a fusion between the new building and and the surrounding and, 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 and the context. So in a way, this building tried to be very precise for this condition, for this um, situation. So in a way, what appeared there, no? Appearing also there, but we reveal it in, in a different way, in another way. No? to create, to discover a new possible reality inside a context. And the public space, this idea that an architecture must be create a social life and public space, it appears inside of the building. Inside of the building there is this big, this big, ah, oh, sorry. Oh, where is it? I know. Uh, it doesn't work. No, there is this big um, foyer that, at the end, what is important is the is what happened inside of this uh, of this building and not the architecture in in itself. And one, when I speak about the the specific, it also means establish a relation with a tradition. No? Uh, here, for example, the Philharmonic Hall is like that because it, it is, exists a tradition that we try to interpret, it, uh, interpret it and transform it in something new. No? And yes, there. Or, for example, if we move in south of Spain, no? Uh, the relation with the context, it's with its um, um, with, with the geography in a way. Now the building try to interpret this this geographical element, establish uh, links with with the with the surrounding. And for that. No? The building is made like this to establish this geographical link with the bay, in a way. And also try to interpret this uh, condition, this south condition that it is present in this, in this context. Uh, when we try to do something specific, specific it is important to think in in the tonality, in the tone of, of an ambient. Uh, here, for example, this is a painting by Tiziano, by Titian, and where he, the, the protagonist and the background are fused uh, and they have the same level of importance. It's because of the tone of the painting. There is something able to uh, establish a relation between the, the figure, the, the protagonist, and the other element, and, and create 
an ensemble. And if we are able in, in architecture to find this, the right tone, the right tonality, we are also able to interpret a context and integrate the building in, in this context. And in a way, it is what we have done in, in this project, for example. We try to interpret an atmosphere, interpret a tonality of, of an ambience, and the, the, the existing building here no? start to work with the new building and start and, and the, the new building and the old building no? they conform a new ensemble no? a new possible reality it is there but again an architecture must be specific for a place specific for a context but also it should create a public space and what is uh, important is the building that in the cover it is exist this new plaza again and the architecture is just the frame the frame not to, to around this uh, this public space and today when uh, we are working it is uh, also in, important the work on the transformation of things. It is, it is important, it is, um, our work is every day more uh, related to transforming something and not only create something new. And, and when we transform something, it is the, the old element and the new element, every element should be complementary in a way. And exactly, this is a project that uh, we have done in, in Switzerland for a museum, where the pre-existing building and the new building they compose a new, a new ensemble. Uh, everyone is is finished in itself. It is independent. It is autonomous. But put together, they conform a new. You, an, a new possible reality for, for this space, a new uh, ensemble. And it is also specific for this place because it tried to reinterpret this idea of ornamentation and decoration that it is present in the old building and, and it conform also the new building. But this idea of Complementarity is present also in other uh, projects. For example, here in, in Italy, where well, the, 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 the new building is facing an old Palladian uh, building. And when we work transforming something, um, we, we need to achieve an, a new value for this object. And, uh, here, this uh, image sh show the kin uh, kintaki uh, ceramic. It's a Japanese uh, technique that permits to recompose a broken ceramic through gold and transform it, transform it in something in, in, a, in a something new with more value than the old ceramic. So, also a small detail like, for example, just uh, a door can can transform an entire building in something new. A back of the old building, you now with this new small element, can assume a different significance than, than the original one. And it is important to clarify also the needs uh, of of the people, of a community, of a society, and try to create architecture based on this need. Because finally, we are convinced that uh, architecture is made on very simple and clear, uh, very simple and basic idea. Uh, so, for example, a house can, a house in China can conform or can assume a significance there just working on the roof, no? as a pure form conform with the roof. Or, for example, another uh, museum in the north of Spain, it is just a shelter 
to protect an, a collection inside and, and try to establish this uh, uh, direct uh, relation with the, the surrounding. Or, for example, a house can just be created with uh, a podium and four pavilion, and just this element can create a new uh, space there. And, and to finish, uh, I return with an image of uh, where is present a man. This is uh, an image made by Filarete, a Renaissance uh, uh, architect. This represents Adam when it's uh, expulsed from the paradise and for the first time he discovers the rain. It is just to uh, remember us that maybe the architecture uh, it's made with very, very simple thing and, uh, things, and he uh, just protect, uh, protect the, the life of, of a man and create a quality uh, of life. Thank you. So, three architects, uh, three different uh, uh, system of, uh, of speech, uh, where Chetil did the direct audio into the audience and you did the microphone. I'm the only one actually, uh, I hope everybody can hear me now. Uh, the microphone is working. So my name is uh, David Saale, I'm uh, one of the partners at BIC. I'm going to talk about uh, social infrastructures. Social infrastructure, as we defined it, is basically what glues the society together. And it's described in this uh, diagram in a way where things are interconnected, in a way where somebody's trash can be another person's treasure. The way that our society works is that sometimes when you think about things that are a little bit bigger than the local picture, you can actually invent things that in combination creates more value than you do if you only look at them separately. Uh, Big, let's see, see if this works out. Yeah. Big uh, is an office, uh, we have um, two main offices, one of them is in New York, the other one is in Copenhagen. The one in Copenhagen is situated in an old warehouse and the reason why a lot of uh, creative businesses or a lot of uh, uh, architects end up in used structures is because of the inherent uh, extra capacity of ceiling heights, of light, of actually inhabiting something in a different way than it was supposed to be inhabited. And by just looking at it with a different set of eyes, you actually get uh, a new way uh, of working. And you could say that that extra uh, level is, and that extra uh, capacity in the workspace is something that we have worked with uh, in uh, the Google project that we are doing in, uh, in Mountain View. You could basically say that Google has over the, over the last um, more than a decade, almost uh, 20 years, moved from, oh, this is not really, moved from, from something uh, that was uh, around 1,000 people to being 30,000 people working there. It's, and when we do a new workspace, one of the first things we start to do is to look at all the qualities that are already there that we do not want to throw out. 
We want to add something new, but we also have to make sure that the inherent things that are in there uh, are preserved. And when looking at the Google Workspace, which is actually already pretty amazing, it's colorful, it's playful, it's active, uh, it's full of... Um, It's too active. I'm, I'm, I'm pushing it too far, too fast. Or maybe I'm running out of battery in this one. I'll just try one more. Maybe I'll stand over here then. Yeah. Uh, or maybe, do we have extra, a new battery for this thing? Now it's working again. Okay. I'm too active. Ah, now it goes back. It's healthy. It's, you could say, the standard Silicon Valley workspace, which is a lot focused on creativity and creating a working environment, which is uh, completely adaptable to the people there. It's actually a very open space where people can bring their own personality to their workspace. But when moving from a thousand people working in one space to actually working globally all over the planet with more than 30,000 people, of course you have to rethink it. Oh, now it went bananas. It, it somehow saved all the, the, the presses I did and then forwarded. Let me just go back. No, now I'm going forward. Oh my god. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is more surprising to me than it is to you. Um, and they've, you could say that they've worked themselves off the uh, mainly focusing on the uh, non-tangible into the more and more physical world, uh, both with the, the Google Cars, the, the different objects that they are producing, uh, but also changing the way that we think about the entire world with Google Earth, uh, which is saved on, on big computers with the way that, that we all uh, use uh, Google Drives, with the way that they drive around and actually monitor the physical world so it's now accessible to all of us by just going to our computer. So the interaction between the, uh, the physical world and the mental world that, that the, the digital age has kind of pushed us into is something that Google has really been a, a key player in. And when growing, they've actually moved from being, you could say, a building into being a community. The Google headquarter is bigger than the downtown Mountain View. So each of these, you could say, Silicon Valley companies are becoming so big that they actually constitute cities in themselves. Um, and the biggest problem with that is that they, inha they, they inhabit existing structures and they all drive to work. So what they basically do is they live on a parking lot. And we wanted to transform, you could say, a parking lot into a real park, uh, still providing the complete flexibility of a, of a large scaled a dome with uh, a lot of, uh, of um, openness underneath and a lot of specific specificity uh, for the people working there. So that's basically the project. Uh, it's, um, it's a project where we're working on, on, on several sites within their campus and we wanted to create something where the building is, uh, you could say, hovering in the green, connecting to the, to the natural landscape around it. We wanted freedom on the individual place, also on the, the small group workspaces. Uh, the team uh, that often work together are around 20 people. They can form neighborhoods or uh, departments and uh, larger communities that, that share uh, bigger uh, uh, functions. And the town that we are creating within a single piece of architecture is actually for 3,000 people. The office support is often something that you can, could say uh, add into a building. We actually here put it underneath the workspace uh, and elevate the workspace up into one big flexible space for 3,000 people. Um, inside the workspace there's openings and they're all then covered uh, by one big dome 
uh, creating the complete flexibility for all 3,000 people. One of the key things that Google said to us when approached us was that their biggest problem was that when they commissioned an architect and he finished the building, their organization had already changed so much that even though they were making very sure that what he drew was the right thing for what they were now, the minute that the building was finished, it was already too old. So they wanted something that was more flexible. And what they wanted was actually more of the spaces that you could say artists inhabit. Uh, so we tried to combine, you could say, cloud for covering the spaces that are uh, in, a, in an extreme uh, uh, hot area. The, um, individuality of uh, the Burning Man Festival uh, with the, um, the little scale of the Medina and situated in a, in a land art campus. So you can say that on, on a normal uh, workspace, the most attracting um, architectural experience is in the arrival zones, it's in the voids, it's in the places that you only transfer through. But as soon as you sit down at your table, you sit at the most boring part of the building. Uh, you could also say that people that are sitting next to the facade have great light conditions, but often they have to draw the curtain in front of uh, the view they have, and they actually end up with either sitting so far from the facade that they don't have ultimate uh, lighting conditions, or actually not having the view that they want. So what we tried to, to, to create here was something where everybody sit in one big space with the perfect lighting conditions, all the, uh, the, the things that normally make noise and, and are visually separating the people, all the support functions are below. And in that way, um, did uh, a building that is uh, sitting in the landscape, has complete flexibility, uh, a lot of... Uh, um, outdoor spaces for people to go outside and, and work, uh, and inside full of um, uh, different inventions, uh, different spaces, which each has its own character, so that it's basically been developed uh, for uh, the people, but also with the people that works there. Um, and it's been a, a, a journey that we've been traveling through for the last uh, year and a half, together with the uh, Heatherwick Studios. And we are soon about to, to break ground uh, on, the, on the project. Um, but just to kind of show the, the, the different workspaces that arise. So basically, each uh, smaller community have complete flexibility. There's nothing defined. And they can then move in with their own individual uh, personalities, add kind of community to community under this uh, uh, giant roof, and almost do like a small uh, competition of creativity underneath the, the ceiling um, uh, at night uh, filled with light. But Getting back to social infrastructure. Social infrastructure is also something for us which is not only about adding uh, social life into the infrastructure that we call architecture. It's also about the infrastructure that is already in cities. Often infrastructure, bridges, uh, highways are, connect are, not, are connecting on a large scale, but on the local scale that we all walk around in, they're often are separators. And one of the projects um, where we work with this was in Vancouver. We were invited to look at, the, um, at this highway intersection where the, the main uh, traffic comes into Vancouver and to see how we could connect two neighborhoods that were completely separated by the infrastructure. The developer there was of course interested in earning money, so he wanted to build uh, houses. We looked at the different setback rules there were. You couldn't build houses underneath the highway. Uh, you couldn't build within 30 meters because of a noise uh, a rule that means that you have to be farther than 30 meters away from, the, from the, the cars in order to build housing. You couldn't build on the corner because there was a small park uh, over there. So the only thing that was left was like a single house uh, plot, 600 square meters, probably uh, like half uh, the size of, of this room, uh, or around the size of this room. Um, and even though he constructed it in 150, uh, 180 meters uh, tall, it would not have enough square meters to be a viable business case for him. So we thought, okay, 
The city wants to transform the local community. He wants to transform his building plot. Maybe we could tweak the rules and say after you are 30 meters above the street, the noise will also be lower and we could extend the building to get closer and in that way have a double the size of a sky print as the footprint. The cores are the same size, so you actually have three times as much syllable area on the top floor than you do on the, on the lowest floor. And the community that it sits within uh, is uh, green roofs that, gives, uh, that you see when you drive out of the city towards the, the surrounding areas. They have an oasis in the middle of them, which is uh, a public square that is uh, uh, protected from the noise by the three buildings around it and becomes this kind of community. Uh, the building almost looks like a, a curtain that's been drawn back and changes completely uh, nature depending on which side you see it from. Um, even though it looks like a, a pretty uh, a challenging uh, structure, uh, the engineers came back to us and said that it could actually be constructed out of prefabricated concrete elements because even though it looks like it's standing on, on one foot, every floor is only less than a meter further out than the one below, so it's actually stepping out quite gradually, and, uh, and it's, it's able to be constructed out of what we call walking columns, where you place one column that is, that is uh, kind of uh, deep on, on top of the other one, just slides it uh, gently out. In the, in the base of the project, uh, it's kind of these uh, triangular uh, spaces in the middle and underneath the highway it's like a 16th chapel, uh, like an in inverted um, uh, a gallery turned upside down where you will have public arts on the underside of the highway. But um, uh, social infrastructure is not only about existing infrastructure that is still being used. Here we are in Elsinger in, uh, in Denmark. Um, where we did a museum in an abandoned uh, dry dock. Uh, the museum is a maritime museum. It was originally on the first floor of the Hamlet Castle, Kronborg. Um, but because the castle got UNESCO World Heritage uh, conditions, the uh, museum was thrown out. It went looking for some other place to live and found this old decommissioned dock that was built in uh, 1952 and hadn't been used for 20 years. So we went up there for the competition and it turned out we couldn't even see it because it was filled with water. Uh, so the space that we should reinterpret was hidden from us. And furthermore, we were not allowed to build as much as a meter out of the ground. So what we actually had to do was to build an invisible uh, iconic building we decided to turn the uh, job that we had been given, which was to fill the dock with functionality, to turn it inside out and actually put the museum around the dock, liberating the dock from both program and uh, functionality, and turning the dock into the icon itself. There's then three bridges that spans the space and connects the museum that is on the outside Kind of like the generic space that you need in a museum needs to be dark and controlled so that you can do artificial lighting. And then all the functions that either need daylight or visibility uh, or when you need a break and want to leave uh, your kind of the, the, the exhibition, you go out and you see the real maritime world, which is the dock. You arrive on this uh, sloping um, uh, bridge that leads you in through the museum and the entire museum is a gentle slope, which slowly leads you down to the, to the bottom of the dock, which is nine meters below the, the water around it, um, and at the end up this uh, grand staircase to the exit, you can go out into the dock and the bridges are, are spanning across, uh, almost like these uh, modern uh, futuristic elements within this old industrial uh, heritage. Uh, of course, we spend a lot of time on the, on the, on the exact detailing of how does history meet future, um, focusing on making bridges that were as transparent uh, as possible. We removed all structure from the facade so that 
you completely see out. You have the cafe lying underneath one of the bridges, uh, which doubled as a staircase uh, that leads you uh, back up to the surrounding landscape. At night, uh, the, the conference bridge is, is lit up from within. And during the day, the outside space is used for, for events and uh, concerts. Um, and in that way, it becomes part of the city's life, even though it was supposed to be have, uh, covered uh, by the uh, uh, museum itself. So I've just shown you kind of how a museum can be turned into a, uh, you would say, how a piece of old infrastructure can be turned into a museum. Here, I'll show you where a museum is actually used for a bridge. We were invited uh, to do a, a competition uh, in Norway where the master plan of a, a sculpture park was collapsing. The sculpture park was expanding on both sides of the river and the uh, logistic of it meant that everybody was moving into dead ends and had to move back the same way they came. So by suggesting the, the building uh, as a bridge, it actually connected everything. So it's actually a continuation of the infrastructure of the park. You walk through the galleries, through the, the, the big open spaces, uh, have a grand staircase that leads you into the panoramic gallery where you have a dialogue with the historical uh, uh, paper mill uh, that is the reason for, for the whole sculpture park to be here. So the new and the old lies there uh, uh, en face and, and kind of celebrate uh, each other. Um, you walk out uh, the other end of the, of the gallery and, uh, and it actually spans these 70 meters across the, the water. Uh, we're breaking ground here in, in around half a year on, on this project. Back to Scandinavia, back to Copenhagen. This is uh, the city uh, I grew up in, where, where Big uh, was kind of born. Um, and the next is probably the most profane uh, project we have ever done. It's a, a factory. It's actually a factory that turns waste into energy. Uh, it's situated um, in the heart of Copenhagen, less than three kilometers away from the, from the Queen. Um, and every time you burn a, a bag of trash, you get light and heat for your apartment. It's going to be the biggest uh, building in Copenhagen. And it's situated, you could say, in the outskirts of the, of the city center, but where there's a lot of um, uh, recreational facilities going on. There's boats, there's um, a water ski, uh, cable car, uh, there's even in the future there'll be a real mountain you can ski on because we've turned the mountain of trash into a real mountain. Denmark is completely flat so there's actually not within a four hour drive we have to go into another country and drive for four hours in order to just get to a small ski slope so this will be the first ski slope in, the, in, in Denmark, um, less than 10 minutes away on a bicycle from uh, uh, most of the, the different boroughs of, of Copenhagen. Um, you have surface lift, you have an elevator in the corner that takes you up from the parking straight up onto the roof, 100 meters up, and you can then ski down uh, 400 meters. And that is to say that the infrastructures, the infrastructural investment that we do in our societies are often much larger than the cultural investments that we do. But we have to build airports, we have to build a, a way to get rid of our waste, we have to think about where our factories are placed and all those investments normally constitute between 90 and 95 percent of society's investment and they are completely dead from social activity. And this is an example of where we've been able, uh, because of a willing client, to turn something into, uh, uh, you could say, a social meeting spot, so that you here in uh, 2017 will be able to ski in the, in the middle of, uh, of Copenhagen. It's 200 meters long, which is a little bit longer than uh, the Olympic uh, 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 half pipe that they had in, uh, in Sachi. 
Uh, it's going to be filled with other activities as well, uh, walking paths, climbing walls, uh, boulders. So it's going to be like uh, full of, uh, of uh, recreational facilities that will completely, you could say, take a part of the city that is normally off limit to, uh, to the citizen and is just uh, factories and actually turn it into something that is a destination where you go. And when you then go there, you can learn about how your city works because you take your elevator in the corner up through the building, it's a glass elevator, you see the entire factory, and then that way understands how your, your building and your uh, entire city works uh, seen from an energy perspective. So this is again a literal version of turning waste into uh, gold for somebody else. Um, we started building it here uh, about three years ago. It's almost done. It's 100 meters high, 200 meters long. Um, uh, the roof uh, is just about to, to finish off and, uh, and the facade is coming on right now. So this is a picture taking uh, less than a week ago. Um, after having worked for the first uh, almost 10 years of our practice uh, almost exclusively in Copenhagen, we were invited to do a project in, in New York and we thought, okay, what can we bring from the European context to the American context that would add something to the value of how they think about their cities? So our assignment was to build a, a, a tower block uh, of housing uh, on top of a, of a retail basis, but we wanted to combine it with the private oasis of a courtyard building that is how all the cities of Europe are basically uh, constructed. Um, and we turned it into uh, what we call the court scraper, the combination of the courtyard and the skyscraper, by lifting up just one corner, allowing uh, west uh, sun into the, to the generous uh, courtyard, uh, and view for everybody in the apartments. Um, the building is, uh, is just uh, done here uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, the first tenants are, are moving in. And, um, it's, you could say, a combination of a square seen from the, uh, from the sky, a triangle seen from, uh, uh, from the side. It's a low building from one side. It's a skyscraper, almost like a spire seen from the other side. And often, a lot of the things that we do uh, have uh, this kind of uh, introduction of opposites, and it's the merging of opposite ideas that actually leads to the, the creative uh, uh, drive because often, as in life, you both want to uh, have children and work a lot and you have to find out or you, you want to travel but you also want to stay at home. And by having to combine them, you actually have to be creative. And um, another uh, uh, version of that um, uh, is uh, the city of uh, New York. The city of New York was uh, flooded by Sandy, and most of downtown went black. Uh, we've been invited to do a piece of infrastructure all the way around the lower part, eight miles of infrastructure. But uh, as Angela Merkel said when she visited, I hope that it doesn't become this wall that separates New York from uh, the water. Of course, it has to separate it. Uh, but it should also be full of uh, social activity. So one of the most interesting uh, projects in New York within the last decade has been the High Line. It's basically a decommissioned uh, piece of infrastructure with an added layer of social life on top. So we thought, okay, maybe we could take the, the success of the High Line and actually implement it into the resilience strategy for the infrastructure of an entire city by inviting people to actually participate. And um, I think there's a little bit of sound here that could come on. It's that was actually sound. Please. I said he was <laughs> so what's going on? Bad. There's a ghost. Was actually <laughs> why you also had a little bit of problems with your movie. He was 
was actually why Sandy was so bad. And is, uh, it's because of oh, yeah. the phase. I will the, speak and say what I think they say. Uh, basically, the superstorm Sandy flooded the uh, lower Manhattan, and okay, let's just go go on. It was uh, yeah, we we'll just go to this. So basically, the idea is that you turn the entire infrastructure project into a social opportunity, um, and by actually inviting all the different people that live all along the coast, the idea is that you turn it from an infrastructure project into something that is a park and a set of pavilions. So it's a, it's a whole other scale and a whole other way of thinking that you suddenly um, transform something that is a, a barrier and suddenly turns it into a connector. And this idea about uh, park and pavilion is uh, leading me to our, our last uh, project that we just opened uh, last week in, uh, in London, which is the Serpentine Pavilion. Um, the idea here is also to take something that is a simple element, uh, here made out of uh, glass fiber boxes. They're all square uh, and the same size, and stacking them on top of each other, basically like a big wall or a big shelf. Seen from one side, it's completely square, but it's pulled out in either end in order to allow people to walk in uh, and allow passage. And it's pulled out in the middle in order to create a, a gathering space. And it basically becomes this, uh, this gateway to the existing uh, Serpentine Pavilion, made out of, you could say, a, a three-dimensional uh, uh, passage, uh, but out of square boxes. And, and this is also one of those things where it's, it's mostly the combination of opposites that has created uh, the, the project. Seen from, uh, from one side, it's almost like embraces the park. Seen from uh, uh, the end, it opens up and allows people to come in. But the building in itself is uh, completely opaque. When you see it uh, from the side and you turn around, it's, it slowly becomes transparent. And it ends up being uh, completely transparent. And the further you go away, the more it disappears until, uh, and, uh, until it almost like completely uh, just becomes uh, like a screen that you can see the park through. All the boxes are the same size and square, but the, the section is more organic. So it's a meeting between both organic and, uh, and, uh, and orthogonal. Uh, in the middle, when you look in one direction, it's open, but when you start turning your head, it closes around you uh, as a space, uh, opens up for, for, for meeting spaces and gatherings. It's like a cathedral, uh, 15 meters uh, tall, and it, you could say the, the openings in the end uh, frame the existing condition of the, of the, of the spire uh, on the existing building. Um, and in that way, it somehow becomes uh, a celebration of the different uh, existing uh, conditions that are uh, all around it. I think that's my last picture. No, there's one more. Now I will invite Kittel, David, and Fabrizio, uh, and, uh, and Alberto. Uh, we have 10 minutes for questions, if you want. Um, on our first visit here, uh, I think one of the most um, uh, obvious things was the, uh, the transition that Beirut is in, but also the, the, the welcoming attitude of, of the people here. Uh, I think for me, at least, it, it's the first time that I've been to a competition where, we've, where we spent the most of the first two days before we actually went to the site. And it, and it felt a little bit like the eight architects that were competitors actually became uh, friends and became more like a group excursion uh, into a foreign territory that was Beirut. And I think and we started by getting introduced to the, to the larger uh, 
uh, background of why Beirut and Lebanon is like it is, and then we slowly zoomed in until we walked through Mar Mikhail and experienced the, the stairs and the, the vibrant city of Mar Mikhail. So I think, for me, the, the zoom was a lot about going from, you could say, a lot of problems, historically, into a lot of potential uh, locally in Mar Mikhail that feels like a place where you can actually build on a hope for the future. Uh, and I think that when you're in from uh, Denmark, which is a very equal society, often you focus more on the, uh, you could say, introducing something extraordinary out of a lot of ordinary. Where here, for me, it's more kind of made, like focusing on maintaining a hope. I know it, it, it maybe it's not very specific uh, as an architectural standpoint, but um, that was my biggest experience of being here. Well, come on, uh, here. Um, well, I think that w w when you design, um, somehow you learn. And when you design in a new place, you learn always something new. And when you learn something new, you change. So design Beirut for us, well, for me, uh, most of all is to learn something new. And I'm going to be different probably in the next years because I did something in Beirut, even if we don't win. Uh, so that's a great, a great step for us, a great step in, in our way of thinking, probably. And that's the main opportunity that you have when you can discover a new place. Yeah, I think that's, that would be my take. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's, it's um, a little bit what is Beirut giving to us, in effect. And I think that is about new experiences and seeing contrasts that are all of a sudden becoming visible to us, which we don't have in certain societies that we live in. And I think from that point of view, we're learning more from Beirut, obviously, about life itself than we can ever contribute in terms of architecture back into Beirut. Yeah, there's somebody. I think that all, the, all, all your three talks were talking about architecture as an opportunity, which I think is the basic and is the center also of this uh, competition. No? Architecture is an opportunity to change, to, the, to give hope, to, to, to present a completely different points of view. Architecture has this amazing power to change the points of view. No? All your works shows it very well. So I think it, this is a, a, it's interesting because overcome the idea of style, of forms, whatever, it's giving a, a different perception of the place and on the, potenti on the potentialities of the, of the, of the sites. Of the so, please. So architects have been blowing up all the classic rules of uh, establishing and building cities over the last 20, 25, 30 years. Now, as a citizen and as someone who is very much influenced by the architecture, my main obsession is always uh, when I look at a new building, if I, if I have to commission a new building, is how to make sure, what's the key and what's your answer, to make sure that what you are creating as mind-blowing concept will keep its freshness in 25 or 50 years. And here I would like, with all due respect to Renzo Piano that I really admire, uh, but wh whenever I go back to Bobur, I feel it's sad, it has faded. Whereas when I look at the Eur Palazzo, let's say in Rome, I feel it's very harmonious. But here it's a little bit sad again. So what's the good balance and what type of warranty of reassurance can you give us when conceiving uh, uh -huh. uh, buildings? Uh, this is a, not an easy question. So who want to? <laughs> <laughs> It's my birthday. Well, f first of all, I, I would um, agree very much with you that being right about things and doing the right thing is very, very difficult. Yeah? Because as societies change, also the awareness that is related to
to however we as people relate to each other uh, is changing at the same time. So in effect, there is not one solution to the issue or to the problems that we're facing. There are thousands of solutions to every problem we're facing worldwide when it comes to urbanization is not one solution. But what is happening right now is that the conditions and the complexities of, let's say, being less harmful is more about how you approach the task. Let's look at the environmental staging of the future architecture, for instance. We know that architecture is contributing to more, or the built environment is contributing to more than 40% of CO2 gases or climatic gases for the moment. Now it needs to change, but will that be, can that change based on the effect of the quality of human lives, for instance? No, it probably cannot. So you have one additional condition that you have to relate to once you're solving the human condition. Now we're getting very much more educated than we were only 100 years ago. What does that mean? It means that your consciousness and your relationship to your surrounding is more of a direct perception. You know what you see and you can read what you see. So you can translate it, you can have an opinion. So all these complexities that we're facing in, in the terminology of, of developing architecture somehow needs to meet the core issues of what we're trying to do when we talk about physical environments. And that means, in the end, that they cannot rely on the structures themselves from a pure architectonic point of view. It will also have to rely on how they're organized. We'll have to rely on the administration of that place. We'll have to rely on how people actually are activated in that place. So if you move away from thinking that architecture is the basic solution of everything, then maybe at least it could be a stage for something new to happen. And that, again, is how it's being used and how that use is being encouraged. So you can have ugly places that are beautifully used and you can have beautifully, beautiful places that are not used at all. That's not the criteria. The criteria is how it's organized. So yes, the solution is not in design only, also in design, also in beauty, but not only. I had a question because all three of you spoke about the bridging of the past, the present, and the future through architecture and the importance of the people throughout it. So my question is, do you think that timelessness is an aspect of the future of architecture? I ha I'll answer this very quickly. There is no such thing as timelessness. There are only evergreens. <laughs> Uh, I think I think the the timeless aspects is a little bit like um, uh, like Plato's uh, vision of a cave, and I think that the way that you do things in the real world would always be a, a specific depiction on a specific site for a specific client, uh, where the in, your interest in uh, architecture and the world meets a specific site and. And it's it's the it's the time specificness of it that makes it uh, that makes it precise, because otherwise it's just something in your head. And and I think that at least for me, I think that's uh, that's often what happens when you when you travel uh, all over the world and 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 work in different places is that. The things that you are interested in and work and, the, and the, the competences that you have, that brings a lot to the project. But it's always, maybe it's, it's just finding the 10% that really sets you free and allows you also as an architect to do something that you never uh, thought you would do uh, and actually learn. 
and it's like otherwise you just are just uh, taking your buildings and kind of like replicating them uh, like timelessness, sightlessness all over the world and, and it's not unless you actually uh, listen that you develop Well, I, I think that timelessness is, an, is a desire, is an aspiration, you know? and probably we will kill to, to, to get something timelessness. Um, but I mean, we, we don't know what's going to be timelessness. But what you need to have is the, in my, my opinion, is the attitude to do something timelessness, something that timelessness sounds too pretentious probably, but something that can survive. I mean, the, the attitude that, that you need to have when you design something is to do something that can survive during the years, during the next years, and try to not extend your vision, but survive means that people finally understood the meaning of something. And when you do something, our first aim is to try to transmit things to the people. And if the people understand it, things are going to become timelessness, probably. I, I think, I think the, 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 the main point is that if it's... Um, like if, if you build the temples of Athens, they're not timeless. They're extremely time but they're specific, but they survive time. And I think what you, what you are... Greens. What? Evergreens. Evergreens, yeah. And, 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 and evergreens are not timeless. They are... Uh, but they, and I think in order, we all want to create something that survives the test of time. Yeah. And I think the way you do that is that you embed like uh, everlasting qualities. Yeah. And of course, those kind of everlasting qualities are what you are kind of investigating uh, through your profession. And 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 you kind of try to. Uh, uh, make sure that, that uh, the soup that you're cooking becomes uh, more and more dense uh, and more and more filled with, uh, with taste. And I think it's basically what makes something survive times is quality. Well, and then, and, and then the quality makes the community being taking care of the building. I mean, a building is timeless because there's a community who takes care of it. Exactly. This is fundamental. People, architecture without people is careless. You know, it's, not, it's not important. So. It's, there was a question. Yes. Yeah. Will you be complying to the U.S. Uh, U.S. Green Building Council's lead standard? The green Building standard. Green buildings. Green. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I try to find something clever to say. I think, I think, uh, I think. I mean, for me, it's not as much the certificate as it is the, the. I mean, for me, the most important part of sustainable is making something long-lasting. Because if you if you tear down anything after 25 years, it's not going to be sustainable. Just the sheer magnitude of building makes the time that a building lasts more important than exactly. Uh, whether it lives up to silver or gold on that or that specific element, and I think uh, I think there's there's a little bit too much focus on certificates and a little bit too less little focus on um, on some higher principles. Maybe, maybe I should add, yeah, yeah, I yeah. but maybe I, I should just add um, it's a very complex situation for the moment, right? So you have lead, you have brim. You have all kinds of certificates around the world. Uh, you have local certificates that are adaptable to certain contextual situations. But for the long run, we have to get down to creating buildings that are CO2 negative. That's the main, really main driver for the future. And that means that you have to take into calculation the embodied energy which is encaptured in every building material, in the transport of the materials, in the food that the workers are eating, in the clothing they're having on while they're producing, in the travel that the work labor has to take on every day to get to work, plus 
the consumption of energy that the building takes to be maintained, to cool, to heat, to wash. And then the last one is when it's being recirculated, the energy that is going in to bring in it back into its point zero condition. When, you have, when we have all these under control, then we can only, first then we can only really talk about truly green buildings. Uh, there's the last one, that guy. I was just wondering when you, when you spoke about trusting presence, if you could just develop more this, uh, what do you mean by trusting presence and which, which part of presence is actually trustable and is not just a fact? I was just wondering if you could just develop this notion a bit more. Thank you. Uh, trusting presence is uh, trusting yourself right now with me and all the others in the room. Uh, that becomes part of the experience that you carry with you because you're here. So it's, it's about now, it's about the moment, as an intersection between past and future. So you will always be in now, obviously, and we're getting very philosophical here, but, but based on that fact, you have no other option. And that's my point. You don't, you cannot choose. You can choose to be here or somewhere else, but when you've chosen to be somewhere else, you're there. You don't have any other option at that particular moment in time. And that is trusting your presence, because if you always feel that you're in the wrong place, at the wrong time, with the wrong ideas, yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Thank you so much, David Zale, Kita Thorsen, Fabrizio Mbarozzi, Fabrizio, Fabrizio Alberto, and uh, thanks for BLF for organizing everything, to IUBE for, for guesting us, and there's a cocktail outside waiting for us. Thank you.